All right, so earlier this week we talked about, there's some talking stuff. Earlier this week we talked about alkane nomenclature. We're going to kind of switch gears today and talk about conformational analysis. But the first question I have for you guys as a warm up is related to these molecules. Are they the same or are they different? Oh, this is tricky. They look different. All right, easy way to check. Let's try to name both of these. So let's name them. One, two, three, four, five. That's the longest chain. So what would this be called? It'd be three methyl pentane. If we go over to the other one, we can identify the longest chain. This is also 3-methylpentane. Why do they look so different? They're rotated, right? So it's important to remember that alkanes involve this sp3 overlap. sp3 overlap can rotate, right? It's a head-on orbital overlap. And so these can flop around in space however they want. We're going to talk quite a bit about this today, but if you ever do get stuck and you wonder whether or not one molecule is the same as the other, just name them both. If they've got the same name, they're the exact same molecule. So let's start with a brief discussion of conformational analysis. The sp3 or sp2 or sp orbital, if it's a sigma bond, it's assumed that it can rotate. So sigma bonds are assumed to rotate freely. And we'll talk about this, and I'm going to actually put assumed in quotation marks because there are some situations where they don't really rotate that freely. And what I mean by this is, let's say we've got ethane, where we've got two CH3s. This sigma bond between them can actually spin, right? So imagine I've got this molecular model kit up here. One side we've got a CH3, the other side we've got a CH3. They can spin around in space, no problem, right? That's really all I mean by conformational analysis. Chemists study conformational analysis using a variety of uh, drawing techniques, and I really like this picture. Um, it's from Mastering Organic Chemistry. It's a website um, that offers tutoring services on the internet. Um, but he's got a whole section that's uh, entitled, Everything I Learned from Chemistry, I Learned from Cats. Um, and you can see we've got three different cats, but we're looking at them using different perspectives, right? So the one on the left is our t traditional bond line formula or line wedge formula. We also have a confirmation called the sawhorse projection. So if you've ever done wood shop or been in somebody's shop, you've typically seen sawhorses where you've got two legs and a bench. Um, and then we're going to talk today about the Newman projection. That's essentially the head-on approach of these um, carbon-carbon bonds, typically. <clears throat> so let's take a look at ethane. Ethane is two carbons. And so we'll use bond line formula first, using dashes and wedges. And so if I draw this, we've got two carbons. Got a hydrogen sticking up here. Down here, hydrogen sticking out of the board, one going back into the board, and then same thing over here. So this would be our bond line formula. We can make this with our model kit. It looks like this, right? You guys might want to start bringing your model kits if you have trouble seeing the perspective, too. <coughs> All right. The Newman projection is a little bit different, so let me show you guys how the Newman projection works. Oh. 
Just like with the cats, we can have the side-on view of the cat or we can have the head-on view. So let's do the head-on view of ethane. And I'm going to draw my pretend eyeball right here. And we're going to be looking straight down this carbon-carbon bond, right? So if we're looking straight down the front carbon, what's sticking straight up? Hydrogen. So we'll draw this hydrogen sticking straight up. This hydrogen that I'm underlying with blue, if we're looking straight at it, should it be up or down, and should it be to the left or to the right? It should be down and to the right. Imagine that dash is going into the board, right? And it's pointed down, so it's going to be down and to the right. So I'll go through and label this as H and then underline it with our blue line just to de designate that it's there. And then this other hydrogen, underlined in red, it's going to be sticking in the other direction. All right, so that's the front carbon. We have to account for the back carbon, too. So what we do is we draw a circle in the back. And this back circle indicates the carbon in the rear. <clears throat> and then we can go through and we can say, all right, this hydrogen labeled in orange is sticking up and to the right or to the left? Right. To the right. Because again, imagine that we're the red eyeball. It's sticking into the board, so it's going to be off to the right. And we'll put that here. And then this, um, let's change colors. Let's do green for the ducks right here. That would be off to the left. And then last but not least, let's do purple down here. So we've got this hydrogen pointing down. That's our purple hydrogen. <coughs> so the Newman projection is always a head-on view. And this allows us to look at bond rotations a lot easier by having this head-on view rather than a side-on view. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually take our ethane and we're going to try spinning it through space. And so let me show you what I mean by that. We're going to look at conformational changes. All right, so I'm going to do a Newman projection here as an example. And this time I'm going to use a red hydrogen sticking up. We've got two black hydrogens sticking down. And I'm going to label this one as red as well. So we've got my Newman projection here with this big model kit. Can you guys see how the front one, the red proton sticking up, the back one is sticking down? You can just look straight down the bond. We've got our Newman projection. Now what we're going to do is we're going to twist one of the carbons 60 degrees, like this. So now we can draw a new Newman projection, right? So the way I like to represent this is just by moving this proton over 60 degrees. And then we're going to move this proton, because it's attached to the same carbon, also over, and this carbon over here. Now when we do this, our back carbon hasn't been touched. It's still hanging out. We've got these black protons sticking there. And then we've got our red proton. Oops. Let me change my color here. Red proton still sticking down, but the carbon in the front's been rotated. And now it looks a little bit like this where this red proton is now overlapping with that black one. And this black one's here, and this black one's here. What do we call it in astronomy when things overlap? An eclipse. We also call it that in chemistry, too. And so we call this our eclipsed conformation.
And we can keep on doing this, right? So let's say I grab this front carbon again and we continue to rotate it. That back carbon's been untouched, right? It's still locked in that same position. So let's start off drawing that back carbon. Nothing's changed there. But now where is our red proton? In the front. It should be over in this position now, right? Because we're rotating it kind of clockwise. So I'll draw this red proton over here. This back proton's stepping up, and we go back down. So a conformational analysis is just this fancy term for rotating a sigma bond in 60 degree increments and then analyzing the relative stability. Which one of these do you think is less stable, the middle one or the two side ones? This is an interesting question. So if we think about these protons, they have an electron cloud in their s orbital. These clouds want to be as far apart from one another as possible. So is it easier to have them aligned with one another or kind of cocked? Cocked a little bit. And so if we look at this, the eclipse conformation where it's perfectly overlapped is slightly less stable than if it's more cocked. So we can actually draw this using a potential energy diagram. So I'll put energy on this axis, and I'll put rotation over here. <coughs> and we said, essentially, we've got some energy conformation. I know this is a little small. Where ethane is cocked. And then we increase in energy to a conformation where it's actually completely eclipsed. And I'll label this too here in a second. And then as it goes back down in energy, it'll actually go back down into that valley, back into another cocked position. All right, so let's go back up to the technical worm, or word isn't cocked, it's actually called staggered. Then we go to eclipsed, and then we go back to staggered. So if we go back down, we can actually label this potential energy surface. We can say this is staggered. This is also staggered. And this is eclipsed. All right. And we said it takes a certain amount of energy in order to do this twisting, right? Because one conformation's at a higher energy than the other. Yep? So do we, do we care about like numerical energy difference or just that there is an energy difference? Well, I'm just going to get to that, yeah. So we can actually measure this energy difference. That's a good segue. It's like I paid you to do that. <laughs> if we look at this, let me move this out of the way. Chemists love calculating things. This difference is three kilocalories per mole. Our typical rule, rule of thumb is we've got heat in the room. How much heat in the room is there? There's about 20 kilocalories per mole of energy in the room. Yep, this is just for ethane.
What do you think happens to ethane if we super cool it down to zero degrees Kelvin? Can it rotate? No. And it's pretty interesting. That's how we can measure these a lot of times. Is if we cool it, it'll <laughs> slow down spinning, slow down spinning to the point where it literally can't rotate anymore. At room temperature, this is like a helicopter. It spins wildly through space, and it can be in any conformation it wants to be in because that energetic barrier is super tiny. When we cool it down, we take away the energy, and it stops rotating as quickly. So we can do a lot of conformational analysis with a variety of these different molecules. This free keto lift. What's that? This free what? Keto calories. Uh, kilocalories, so kcal. All right, so um, I gave you guys a problem of the day yesterday. The problem of the day is going to be related to this, but we're going to be looking at butane, or sorry, yeah, butane instead of ethane. And what I want you to do is imagine looking down carbon 2 through carbon 3 and do the same 60 degree twist and try to draw out as many different conformations as you think possible. Some of them might be duplicates. If they're duplicate, try to rule them out. But try to work in a team on this and see if you guys can figure out the different conformations. And then if you want, try to assess which one's most stable and which one's least stable. So let me actually move this down here. We've got our bond line structure. And I said we're going to look down carbon 2 and 3 in butane. And so if we look at our Newman structure, the carbon in the front has a CH3 sticking up. Proton out here. Proton out here. Our back carbon, we've got proton sticking up. Proton sticking up. And a CH3 group sticking down. Do we agree on that one? Yes. All right. Looks good. Now what we've got to do is take one of those carbons, either carbon 2 or carbon 3, and we've got to twist it. So let's take this one, rotate it 60 degrees. We'll take this one, rotate it 60 degrees. We'll take this one and rotate it 60 degrees. What do we call that conformation when they're perfectly overlapped? Eclipsed. eclipsed. So we should, when we rotate it, go into a new eclipse conformation. The back carbon hasn't really been touched, so we can just draw that in as normal. But now, we've got a CH3 overlapping with that hydrogen. We've got a hydrogen overlapping here. Whoops. We should intersect. And then, we should have a hydrogen overlapping over here. So we've gone to a new eclipse conformation. All right, let's do the same thing and go further. So we're going to grab this methyl group, take it down here. We'll grab this proton, take it over here, and then rotate this over here. So we're twisting it another 60 degrees. Again, our back carbons remained untouched. But now the CH3 group is over here, and we've got a proton up here, and a proton down here. All right. We're not quite done, but let's take a little break. And what I want you guys to do is rank these from most stable to least stable. And then talk to your partner and explain why you think one's more stable than the other. All right, do I have any volunteers to rank these from most to least stable? All right, Casey, what do you think? Which one's most stable? Left, middle, or right? Left. Left. Why do you say the left one's most stable? Because the CH3 and the CH3 are completely opposite of each other. 
Exactly. Those methyl groups take up room in space. They want to be as far apart from each other as possible. All right. Which one's next most stable? They do take up more space, but in this case, the eclipse conformation is actually a little bit less stable because they're perfectly overlapped in space. They're orthogonal, and that's destabilizing. So this one is a little tricky, but you're on the right track. In the staggered conformation, we run into this problem where these methyl groups start to feel each other through space. And what we do is we call this a gauche effect. Gauche just simply means you have two groups that are starting to feel each other through space. Eclipse means that you're perfectly overlapped, right? All right, so let's continue on and do some more Newman projections here. So I'm going to drop them below. We're going to leave the back carbons as is and only move that front carbon. So next one, if we take that CH3 and rotate it down, it's going to be perfectly overlapped with the new CH3, right? Is that going to be very stable? No, no it's going to be hugely unstable. So not only is this eclipsed, but it's eclipsed and both of the methyl groups are overlapping with one another. Let's see if we can do any more. All right, back carbon is going to be exactly the same. We've got the CH3 down. Now our front carbon is in the staggered conformation. Got CH3 over here, proton up, proton up. And then let's just try to do one more here. We're going to move the front carbon again, but leave the back carbon in place. <coughs> so now our CH3 is overlapping over here. We've got a proton over here, and we've got a proton over there. <coughs> All right, now what I want you guys to do is we already ranked these top ones relative to one another. Let's try to rank all of these. Which one's most stable, which one's least stable, and there could even be some that are equivalent stability. Which, which might be equivalent? You know, this one's also got a Gauss interaction. It's the exact same Gauss interaction in that top right hand corner. So those are going to be equivalent. So let's go through and rank these. This is going to be most stable. We said this one is probably going to be least stable. We said that these would be second, these would be second, and then if we look over here, these would be third, and that's the same stability as over here. Can you guys kind of see that? How our eclipse one in the top, we've got a CH3 overlapping with an H and another CH3 overlapping in the H. Same thing over here, CH3 is overlapping with an H, CH3 is overlapping with an H. So we can Say most stable, second most stable, third most stable, and then least stable or fourth. Yep. So, um, are ellipse more stable or just staggered is almost always more stable than eclipse. The eclipse is very destabilizing. All right, so for the four potential options, we could list our first one, either one of our second ones, our third ones, and then our fourth one on there. So occasionally you will come into confirmations that even though they look different on a page, 
have the exact same energy. And that's kind of what I was looking for. So I'm going to let you guys hang on to that as just an in-class activity, but let's do the same thing we did with ethane and try to draw this on a potential energy diagram so we can come up with our roller coaster ride. I'm going to do my best to fit this in on one page here. So this is energy here, this is rotation. <coughs> We've got a little well on the end, one up here, one down here. I'm gonna put one up here. Bear with me guys. All right, let's connect these with a smooth line. There we go. Not the most artistic, but it gets the job done. And we'll draw these in. The first one, we've got a... CH3 sticking up and down. We said that this is far and away the most stable conformation. Right? And we said that this essentially is going to be the same conformation on the other side. H, H, C, H, 3. All right. What we call this when the methyl groups are on opposite sides is we call them anti. So they're staggered and they're anti. Anti. And then staggered. Anti. And then if we're converting between these, we said we would go through an eclipse conformation. Where now we've got hydrogens overlapping with our carbons. And this one would have a CH3 over here and the H here. We said that these would be eclipsed. I'm just going to copy this because I can. <laughs> you guys don't have to unless you really want to. It's going to be the same on both of those humps. <clears throat> All right. And then in between, we've got our gauche, right? So let me put the CH3 up. And then I'll do the same over here. We said these are gauche because we've got these two methyl groups that are starting to clash with one another. This is also staggered gauche. And then what one are we missing in our energy diagram? One with this methyl Yeah, the eclipse with the methyls overlapping. <coughs> and so we'll add this one in last but not least. Thank you guys for being patient. I know drawing these is sometimes tedious. one's also eclipsed. All right, so we can see that in this case, it's a little bit like an uneven turnstile. Some of the rotations take more energy than others, right? Yep. 
What's that? Could we ever do it without like the H's? Just to draw a line? You can. It, I prefer that you guys try to visualize how big those groups are dangling off. The bigger those groups are, the less likely they want to rub past one another during a rotation. So for example, if we switch those two methyls to, to eth two ethyls, they're less likely to want to interact with one another through a rotation. So the longer and longer we get, the more interactions occur. This is about the most complicated we're going to get in terms of uh, rotation features. I will ask you guys to try to do Newman projections with different molecules, though. Yep. Nope, gauche is always in a staggered conformation where you've got two right next to each other. You could call that eclipsed and sin. Eclipsed. Sin just means it's on the same side. All right, now let's do a little bit of our energy analysis. And if we look for going here to here, it's, it takes a very little amount of energy, 0.9 kcals per mole. Pretty small amount of energy. Or actually, sorry, I've got the wrong number. Sorry. This is 3.6. It's gauche. So G-A-U-C-H-E just means we've got these two methyls kind of rubbing up against each other, but it's staggered. So it takes 3.6 kcals per mole to get from that staggered ante to the eclipse conformation. If we're looking at measuring going directly from the staggered ante to the full eclipse where it's sin, this is about 6.0 kcals per mole. Will this happen at room temperature? Yeah, we've got 20 kcals available at room temperature, so it's e easily going <coughs> to surpass this. And then last but not least, if we're measuring how much energy it takes to go from staggered anti to staggered gauche, um, this takes, what was it, 0 0.9 kcals per mole. There we go. We've done our complete diagram for what it takes to rotate a butane. You can see because the eclipse sin is so high in energy, it takes a lot of energy to get past that barrier, but still it can overachieve it at room temperature. What do you think would happen if we had two tert butyl groups instead of methyl groups there? Do you guys remember what tert butyl groups are? Yeah, then it's going to have an even harder time getting past one another. Um, we'll look at some of these weird situations later on this term. Yeah, the less stable it is, the more energy is required to get it up to that unstable state. Exactly. All right, let's do some practice with drawing a Newman projection. No, I just I like showing people the relative amounts of energy. I'm not going to quiz you and say, how many kcals per mole does it take to twist two chlorobutane? Um, that's a little nuts. All right. So practice. Draw the Newman projection down the 3, 4 bond in the following. All right. And this one sticking out here is a wedge. So first thing we need to do is Number it, right? Which way are we going to number? Left to right or right to left? Left to right. Left to right. We want to minimize numbering, right? So let's do it like this. We'll say we've got one, two, three, four, five, 
6. So we're going to be looking down the 3-4 bond. So let's make our pretend eyeball. Pretend eyeball is right there. We're looking down the 3-4 bond. we got to draw the Newman projection. So I'll give you guys a minute to work on that and then double check with your neighbor to see if you agree. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, um, am I always going to tell you which bonds to look down? Yeah, because we could draw a Newman projection looking down the two three bond, or the four five bond, or through the five six bond. So I'll give you guys some guidelines for which Newman projection to look at. Once you've got the Newman projection, try to draw all three staggered conformations that are possible. You guys want a hint too that'll make things easier? What do we call this group dangling off there? Yeah, so we can abbreviate carbons five and six as ET. We can abbreviate this as ME, and we can abbreviate this as what? ET. ET. So we can abbreviate a lot of our functional groups and avoid drawing a bunch of carbons that look like spider webs dangling through space. Raise your hand if you think you've got one Newman projection at least. All right, so we're getting there. What's going on at carbon three? There's a hydrogen. How many of you guys remember the hydrogen that was hiding there? Yeah. So another hint, all hydrogens are assumed. This hydrogen must be sticking back into the page in order for that carbon to be tetrahedral. So maybe that'll help some of you. And then remember on carbon four, we also have two hydrogens. We've got one sticking out of the page, one going back. There we go. Hopefully that'll help settle it for you guys. So carbon four had two assumed hydrogens, carbon three only had one. All right, so let's imagine we're looking down carbon three. What's sticking straight up? An ET or an ethyl. So ET is our abbreviation for ethyl. What's sticking to the right, the bottom right? Methyl. methyl. So methyl's got a, a dash, so it's sticking out of the page. Or sorry, a wedge, and so it's sticking out of the page. And then, last but not least, we've got this hydrogen. On the back carbon, we've got two hydrogens sticking up here and here. And then we've got our ethyl group sticking down. Let's do our other staggered conformation. So I'm going to this time keep the front carbon the same. So I'm going to draw all of these and then we'll fill in the gaps. So we're holding the front carbon constant and only moving our back carbon. All right, so let's move this hydrogen over to where this hydrogen is, this hydrogen over to where the ethyl is, and this ethyl over to where that hydrogen is. All right, so now the ethyl group should be over here. We've got a hydrogen, and we've got a hydrogen. You can do the same thing, right? 
we can move this ethyl group clockwise over here, this hydrogen clockwise over here, and this hydrogen clockwise over here. So we're doing our turnstile. Now we've got ethyl, hydrogen, and hydrogen. All right, which one of these is most stable, which one's least stable, and which one's in the middle? Talk with your neighbor and see if you guys can agree on a ranking for our four staggered confirmations. We're gonna skip the eclipse because we know they're higher energy confirmations. So for this one, let's focus on staggered. You could draw eclipse, but we know they're very high energy. Has anybody reached a consensus with their partner? Yeah. All right, so before we answer this, let's go through and identify all of our Gauche interactions. So we've got a Gauche interaction here and here, right? So that methyl group is butting up against that ethyl. A hydrogen isn't involved in a Gauche interaction, so that's it. This one, we've got an ethyl rubbing against an ethyl. This one, we've got an ethyl rubbing against an ethyl, and this ethyl rubbing against a methyl. So, now that we know that, hydrogens are really tiny, they don't have huge Gauche interactions. Which one's most stable, left, middle, or right? Left. left, because it's got the minimal Gauche interaction. So this is most stable. Which one's least stable, middle or right? Right, because it's got two Gauche interactions, so this is least stable in between. So we can do confirmational analysis and we can say quite clearly the Newman projection on the far left represents the most stable confirmation of the molecule that we had drawn above. All right, make sure that you guys try to stay up to date on sapling. I know we don't have a quiz on Monday, but we're going to finish up chapter four tomorrow or on Monday. Yeah, no problem of the day. <laughs>